God is awesome. I'm thankful that God has allowed us to assemble here again and to worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm thankful that God has given me a, another opportunity. He's given me a gift. He's given you a gift. And that gift is today. That God has allowed you to see this day that what promised to you. Um, uh, many of us have friends and loved ones who have not ushered into 2024. We have many who are sick right now. Um, and so we are we are thankful. We have many, we have many reasons to complain about stuff, but God has given us even more reasons to give him thanks. And so I'm just thankful that God has allowed us to be here uh, another day. Um, I know it's a little chilly. I don't know what's going on with the heater, y'all, but if, if it's like this next week, then here's what we're going to do. I'm telling you up front. We're going to go back into that fellowship hall, and we're going to break this thing up. We're, if, if all of us can't fit in there, then what we'll do is we'll have two services, all right? We'll have a sunrise service and our regular 10 o'clock service. Y'all with me? Uh, all right. Now, if you want to, you can sit in here cold like this, all wrapped up in your jackets the way I see you. <laughs> but if it's like this, but well, we figure out what in the world is going on, then we'll just we'll have our two worship services in the fellowship hall, right? Yeah. All right, all right. Y'all stand with me a little bit. Let's get a little bit of that chill out your bones. <laughs> Titus chapter 3 is what we'll be, y'all. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Yeah, Titus 3. I'll begin at verse number 3. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 3. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice, in envy, hateful, hating one another, but when the kindness of God, our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we have been made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now this is a trustworthy statement, and concerning things I want you to speak confidently, watch the purpose statement, so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds, these things are good and profitable for men. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to talk to you briefly, y'all, from this thought in mind. It's time to break up with what used to be. Or oh, the middle section ain't say one thing. It's time to break up with what used to be. Uh, perhaps you don't see what's happening. Now, we've been talking about the power and purpose of the gospel, and I've just given you little fancy titles, subtitles under that. So a few Sundays ago, you remember, we talked about it's time to embrace the foolishness of God, right? And where that is in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, God takes the foolishness, the foolish preaching. Well, men who deem the cross to be foolishness, God takes what men deem to be foolish and he uses it to save mankind. So the cross to the Greeks, the cross to those in 1 Corinthians was foolishness, but it was that foolishness that God used to save mankind from sin. Then you remember we talked about it's time to break up with debt. And you remember it said in uh, Colossians chapter 2 where Paul said, listen, there is, a, there is a cutting away, there is a circumcision not made with hands. And he says, it is the cutting away of the sins of the flesh. That is, when a man is baptized uh, into Christ, he is now God, not man, God cuts away something from his life. He cuts away him and he breaks him up with sin. And then Paul showed us in that same Colossian letter that God, through Christ, canceled our debt. 
So God took away not only the sin, but he canceled the debt. Now, I don't know about you, but I got a little bit of debt that I just wish would just go away. And so if you're like me, then you recognize that any amount of debt you want canceled, you want clear, you want gone from your life. Well, God, through Christ, cancels, watch this, our sin debt. Well, on today, I need you to see that there are some things we need to break up with. And breaking up with what, Fred? Breaking up with what used to be. Some of us are still holding on to some faults, some hang up, some decision, some problems that we've had even in 2023 when you should have let that stuff go. We are still holding on to some stuff that God says, I need you to break up with. Some of us are still holding on to some relationships that you know are no good for you. And God is saying, I have given you my son, Jesus Christ, so that you can break up with some stuff. Some of us are still holding on to our former life, our past. And God is saying, now that you are a child of God, through Christ Jesus, it's incumbent upon you to break up with what used to be. If you're going to walk in the power and purpose of Almighty God, then you've got to be willing and come to the resolve to break up with some old stuff, to break up with your past, to break up with uh, what holds you back from God, to break up what keeps you going in, in the right direction, elevated with God. You've got to break up with some stuff. And I can't get no witness in here that you need to break up with some stuff. See, so that means y'all still holding on to some stuff that you ain't needed to break up with. Isn't that right? Now, I need to also pause because today was our casual kickback Sunday. I don't have a, um, I see I see my buddy over here, Sister the hard road. She's got, uh, bless her heart, she's got an Atlanta Falcon jersey on. Um, we're going to pray for her spirit, y'all. <laughs> I'm just teasing, but, but um, I, I, my, I gotta get my jersey, y'all. I gotta get my San Francisco 49ers jersey. Don't hate on me. Don't hate. Don't judge me. That's just what it is. I gotta get my my San. So I tried to wear some colors at least that would represent them. Now I see a few Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, and you know, hey, yeah. Uh, but we're going to pray that they find a quarterback. You see what I'm talking about? Because they, they need some help, too, so they need some <laughs> All right, y'all. And, and I, you ain't no Philadelphia, is it? Yeah. You know, Eagles. Yeah. Well, there ain't going to be no touch push in this Super Bowl, so. <laughs> All right, y'all. But, yeah, so next time when we do this, I'll make sure I have my jersey ready so I can wear my jersey. But, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't see that. The what? We got some Washington Commander fans, and Lord have mercy. We're gonna put you over there with Sister Hargrove, and we're gonna pray for you too. <laughs> Who? Oh, the dog. Now, now I ain't got. Yeah, y'all, 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 y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And now, um. Now, I do know somebody that the Dolphins, yeah. yeah. But I do know somebody that showed up to some prayer. His name is David Banks. Yes, <laughs> and y'all make sure y'all pray for him. When y'all see him, now, you ain't going to miss him because he's dressed down in all his cowboys' gear. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Won't comment on that. But David, I love you, bro. I love you. He, he is definitely a cowboys fan. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, David. Look like you might have to go back there and play quarterback for him. I, I don't know, man. They're struggling right now. <laughs> no, but listen. So there's, today is our casual kickback Sunday. Welcome all of all of our visitors and friends uh, to our kickback Sunday today. Titus chapter three. I want you to make up in your mind that whatever it is you're going that that, that you're going to do for God and with God, that you're going to break up with what used to be. Yeah. That's what Paul is talking about. Now you got to remember, he's writing this letter to a young preacher named Tim, uh, Titus. I'm getting ready to say Timothy. Titus, just like he wrote first and second Tim letters to, to Timothy, first and second Timothy, he's writing to this young preacher, Titus. And he's telling Titus to stay in the city of Crete 
which is heavily idolatrous, which has a lot of lascivious living, anything uh, sinful you can engage in went on in Crete. And he says, I need you to stay there and preach the gospel and to teach Christians how to live. Now, the point that I'm making in terms of our breaking up with what used to be, I need you to understand that when God saves us, when it comes to the power and purpose of the gospel, when God saves us, that same saving gospel must be and is the very same thing that will transform you. So when God saves you, God expects to not only deliver you from sin, but he also expects a change in your lifestyle, a change in your behavior. It would not be enough. And how detrimental and what a slap in the face for us to say that we believe in Jesus. We believe that he is the son of God. We believe that he died was buried and resurrected and then our life speaks completely different to the life he gave for us. Yeah. And so our life has to change. He wants us to see that you've got to break up with what used to be. You are no longer defined by your past. You are no longer defined by your, your hang up and mishap. You are no longer defined by what used to be. God through Christ has given you a new life. And so we've got to embrace that new life. You've got to embrace who he's making you out to be now so that you can live life abundantly. Are y'all tracking with me? Well, I want to show you something because what Paul does, he says, the first thing I need you to understand is you need to really, in order to embrace this new life, in order to embrace uh, your breakup with some stuff, that you, you won't appreciate the power of the gospel until you realize how destitute you were. Mm -hmm. right. How sinful you used to be, right? Y'all need to say amen, because if y'all ain't saying amen, y'all making me think y'all still sinful. Right. Jesus, amen. Lord. All right, so watch what he said. He said. Here's the first thing. God saved us. But now, in order to appreciate God saving us, we are going to have to look at what we used to be. Yeah. Now, notice in verse two, in chapter three, verse two, we're going back up. In chapter two, he will start talking about uh, how uh, Titus is to instruct uh, sound doctrine. He is to speak sound doctrine. I need you to understand, sound doctrine isn't always talking about why we don't sing with musical instruments. That, no, no, no. We've attributed sound doctrine to some stuff the apostles did. What sound doctrine is in the letters of First and Second Timothy and in Titus has to do with healthy living. Are y'all tracking what I'm saying? So sound doctrine is, sound doctrine just simply means healthy teaching. So when he says, make sure you instruct the, the older women how to teach the younger women how to love their husbands and their children, that's sound doctrine. When he says, young men, old men, older men, make sure you live your life sensibly with self-control. That's sound doctrine, right? When he tells the young men, Titus, make sure you instruct the young men how to treat older men, how to treat basically their elders, right? Be respectful to all. That's sound doctrine. Are y'all with me? So now he gets to chapter 3. And he says, make sure, he says, I need to remind you of something. Right. Titus, I want you to remind them to be subject to rulers and authority. Right. If you don't know what that means, he's simply saying, I need you as a Christian, to a preacher, to instruct other Christians as to how to respect and, and to live according to the rules and laws of the land. Right. So just because you're a child of God doesn't mean you can break the rules and laws of the land. Right. Are y'all with me? There is a certain conduct. Now, when he speaks to this, he gives them a reminder, and the reminder is simply saying stuff that they would that Paul takes for granted they already understand. Right. He's saying, I remind Titus, remind them of, of certain things because there's a certain way that I, I really believe you already know how you ought to behave and how you ought to conduct yourself. In other words, remind them of their Christian ethics. Y'all with me? So he says, remind them 
but to be subject to rulers and authorities, right? To the government, even if you don't like the president. Even if you don't like his policy, and perhaps even if we were to have a female president, even if you don't agree with her policies or his policy, you still have Christian ethics that you must adhere to. Right? right? Because there is a higher calling that's over your life, that's higher than the government of these United States of America. Right? He says, so make sure that you conduct yourself with the proper Christian ethics. But watch what he does next in chapter 3. He says, also, be ready, or be obedient, right? Be ready for every good deed. And then he says, malign no one. In other words, don't kill off your neighbor, right. his character, right. right? By what you say. He says, be obedient, malign no one. Right? Uh, and then he says, be peaceable and gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Look at what he said. He says, this is what you ought to be. This is the sum total of your Christian ethics, that you don't malign people, that you don't be gossipers that's killing off your fellow man, right? right. That, you, that you be peaceable and gentle. Christians ought to be people of peace. The last thing that should be said about a child of God is that you're stirring up strife. That when they see you come, they see you like you're the Tasmanian devil. Right? Christians ought to be a people of peace, but, but in that peace, you are a people who don't compromise with truth. Right. Are you with me? You stand for something. Right. So he says, be peaceable, be gentle, right? He said, watch this now. Watch what he says that. For we also once were foolish. We were disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts, pleasures, and spending our life in malice and in envy. We were hateful and hating one another. He says, this is the life you used to have. This is the thinking you used to, you used to be. He said, you were once deceived. Now notice the contrast. He says, be gentle, be peaceable, peaceable. Make sure you are respectful to your rulers and authorities. Make sure you, you don't malign anyone. Then he reminds them, he said, because you used to be this way. Right? Right? right. Power in the gospel is you remembering how you used to be. You ever hear people say, sometimes, especially Christians, listen, don't, don't make me go back to what I used to be now. <laughs> Y'all ever said that? Don't make me act, don't, don't bring out this old man now. Don't you? See, y'all trying to act like that, all they saying that. All right, don't, don't, I'm trying, I'm trying to keep my old person dead. Y'all finna resurrect him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, well, in order to be in touch, in order to be peaceable and gentle and kind and, and understanding to other people, he says the first place to start is remembering how you used to be. Amen. Amen. Right. He, said, he says, you've got you've to gotta remember how bad your former life was. And if you're honest, if you just tell the truth, if I just get three of y'all to tell the truth, you know there's some stuff in your past, the way you used to be, that you want to stay locked up in your closet. Amen. Amen. Isn't that right? That you don't want anybody to know about. Well, he says, remember now, there's some stuff, there's a past that God has, break, has broken you away. He breaks you up from what used to be. I used to be deceived. I used to be disobedient. I used to malign others. I used to castigate others. I used to kill off my fellow. I used to engage in this and engage in that. All of that stuff before I gave my life to Christ. But watch this. But when the kindness of God, Amen. our Savior, is that in the text? Amen. Yeah, yeah. That's what I used to be. But I'm no longer what I used to be because when the kindness of God our Savior and his love appeared, 
Yeah. Oh. In, all, in other words, when it became, when it illuminated my life, when that kindness, boy, that's kindness literally means benevolent. It is goodwill towards someone. Now notice the power in this thing, y'all. He said, when you used to be this, he says, God did that. When you used to be evil, when you used to be wicked, when you used to run and do whatever it was you did according to the lust of the flesh, he says it was the, according to the kindness and the love of God that he saved you. Amen. Watch it. The, the, watch it now. Notice. He says, now when, when he says, when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind up here, he saved us. That saved us is the main verb. Now watch this. Paul could have easily said, when the kindness of God, our Savior, and, the, and his love appeared, God saved us. He could have stopped right there. That would have gave you a complete thought, right? When the kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, and his love, excuse me, uh, and his love appeared, he saved us. Period. You would have understood that. Well, what Paul does next is he gives Sister Hazel what's called a counterpoint. To, to, and he gives a point and a counterpoint so that he would bring emphasis to the main point. The main verb is he saved us. Right. Now he gives the counterpoint. He says the counterpoint, in order for you to understand just how deep the, the depth and the scope of this love is, he says it's not by works of righteousness we have done. Oh, that should have got a lot more amen. He says in order to appreciate God's love, God's kindness for you and or toward you, he says him saving you was not by your own doing. Amen. Him saving you had nothing to do with your good deeds. In other words, you don't merit this salvation. You, you don't merit this kindness and love. There's, you don't earn this kindness and love. There is nothing you could have done in your what used to be that would have earned God's love and kindness in your life. He says, but it was according to the kindness of God's, God's love. But then he says, watch this. He says, then it wasn't, watch the counterpoint. Counterpoint is, it wasn't according to your own righteousness or deeds you have done, watch it, but according to his mercy. <laughs> oh, now that's the, look at the counterpoint. And the, it was because of God's mercy, not because of your righteousness, not because of what you did. It had all to do with God's mercy that he loved you and he was kind towards you so much so that he saved you. Amen. Look at the power in this thing now. He saved you. God saved us. Yeah. Why did God save us? Because he loved you and he wanted to be benevolent toward you. Amen. Amen. Do you see this thing? He's power. I mean, there's power in this thing. Now that kind of power, when you really think about it, when you understand that it wasn't anything that I did, that it, was, that, that it wasn't anything that I could have given that would have brought on this kind of love for me, then it will induce proper behavior in your life. Because watch this, it's that same kindness and that same love that keeps you living right. It's the same love, the same kindness that keeps you getting up even after you fall. That keeps you trusting even when things get dark. That keeps you walking with him even when the world says you ought to give up on him. It's that kindness and that love and that mercy that keeps you in touch Amen. with Christian ethics. Amen. Amen. He says, he says, he says, he says, now this kindness is benevolent. It, it's generous. It's good love, uh, kindness. Then he says this love, it comes from a Greek word, philanthropia, where you get our English word philanthropy. He says that's, now this love here in agape love is philanthropia, which means this love is, is a love, he says, and he, he does it where it's a love that is concerned 
about the well-being of another person. This love runs so deep that God is concerned about what hurts us. He's concerned about what we suffer from. Right. Are you tracking with me? It's one thing to say you love someone. It's another thing to demonstrate that you love that person. Right. Are y'all with me? He says, now that's how God operates. God loved us so much that he, he's philanthropia toward us. His love is always seeking out our best interests. Yes. He wants what's good for you. Yes. Now, if he wants what's good for you, then you should never seek to want to go back to what you used to be. Because what you used to be has nothing good for you. Are y'all with me? So what used to be should always propel you when you think about it and you're reminded of it. It should always propel you forward. Right? Anytime you think back on what you used to be and you go back to what you used to be, then you will never live life on the plains and the, and the mountaintop of what God has ordained you to be. Yeah. You will always live life on ground level. Yeah. Y'all with me? Yeah. So watch this now. He says now, this, he saved us not by works of righteousness, but according to his mercy. Now notice the next thing he's going to show us. He saved us, mm -hmm, and then he's going to show us that this saving is not a work of man. He says, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. And what's the next thing? By the washing of regeneration. By the washing. Lutron is the Greek word for washing. Now, it is in reference to baptism. But let me say this. He says it was also by, did you notice the definite article in front of washing? The washing which means he's specific about the washing. This washing, they would have known to be Christian baptism. But now watch this. Baptism is not the washing. It is the occasion where the washing takes place. Let me say it again. Baptism is not the washing, neither is washing baptism. Rather, it is the occasion, it's the place where washing takes place. Your question is, is who does the washing? God. <laughs> it's the I know that's right. Lutron. There's a derivative word from the Greek word lutron, apple lutron, which is the same word that's used in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. You remember when Jesus says husbands love you. Paul says that Jesus commands husbands to love their wives even as Christ loved the church. Watch this now. And he gave himself for it. What's it? The church. Who's the church? All those who have been saved by the blood of Jesus. All those who have been washed. He gave himself for it. Watch it. That he might sanctify it by the washing of water by the word. Are y'all with me? Yeah. All right. So now he says this washing, this lutron, is, this is also seen. Y'all got a minute? <laughs> this is the, this apple lutron. Look at, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's always connected. Christian baptism is always connected with the washing. But it's God who does the washing. This washing then is seen in connection with proper behavior and a new lifestyle, right? Watch it, watch 1 Corinthians 6. Y'all got it? First, first, I don't know, hold on. 1 Corinthians 6, look at verse nine. 1 Corinthians 6, look at verse nine. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, infeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor re re reviles, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now watch what he says in verse 11. And such were some of you. In other words, that's who you used to be. Watch him now. He says, but you were sanctified. 
and you were justified in the name, you, I'm sorry, but such were some of you, but you were what? Washed. Well, when I'm washed, what happened? I'm now sanctified, and I'm now justified. Is that in that text? Yes. Yeah. So if I want to be justified, and I'll explain that in a minute, if I want God to sanctify me, I've got to first be washed. Are y'all y'all hearing me? He says, now look at this, look at the power. He says, such were some of you. In other words, you used to be that. But now that you've been washed, there is a clear breakup of between what you are now and what you used to be. Are y'all seeing this? Well, y'all ain't liking this? Yeah. Or y'all trying to process. Uh, okay, okay, y'all brought so, so notice now, he says, and such were some of you. He says, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of God. Run over to Acts chapter 22. You remember there was a man named Ananias and a fellow by the name of Saul of Tarsus, yeah. who God later changed his name to Paul. Yeah. You remember, I want you to notice something. In Acts chapter 22, Paul, uh, uh, he is given some instruction by O Ananias. Now, in Ananias' instruction, uh, I need you to notice verse 16. Now, notice, well, verse 15, Ananias says to him, say he's, he's talking to Saul of Tarsus. He said, the God of, uh, I'm in verse 14, I'm sorry. The God of our fathers have appointed you, Saul of Tarsus, to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear an utterance from his mouth. You will be a witness for him to all men of what you have, have seen and heard. You remember when he was on the road to Damascus, he got hit with the bright light, he was blinded. He had to receive his sight in order, and then Ananias tells him what he needed to do. Y'all remember that, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, all right. Now, he says, now, why do you delay? Get up, be baptized, and watch this, and... Wash, apple neutron, wash. Remember, I told you. So the washing comes after the baptism, which means when I go down in baptism, in the watery grave of baptism, guess what God is doing? The water doesn't wash away my sins. The blood of Jesus washes away my sin. But God applies that blood when I do what? When I'm baptized, and when he applies the blood, what is he doing? Washing. Washing. Are y'all tracking with me? Yes. He washes sins away now, and then he's calling on the name of the Lord. I just gave y'all a snippet of next week's sermon, which will be, make that call. Because he told Saul, now, arise, be baptized. It literally translates, get yourself baptized and wash away your sins. Watch the next part and call on the name of the Lord. Right. It's time to make the call. All right, but that's for next week. We'll save that for next week. Watch this, though. So come back to Titus. He says he did it. God did it by the washing, here's this big word, of regeneration. Yeah. Oh, this gets good, y'all. <laughs> because the word regenerate literally means to restore, right. to renew. To rebirth. Right. It's in connection to what Paul or uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus. You remember Jesus had a conversation with a fellow by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Y'all yeah. read, read your Bible? Y'all yeah. yeah. better say something. We're going to have to turn there. In John chapter 3, Jesus had a, a, a conversation with Nicodemus and he says, Except a man be born again, again, he cannot see or enter the kingdom of heaven. That man must then be born of water and spirit. Nicodemus says, well, how can that be? Seeing that I'm a grown man, he didn't get it. Jesus says, through this regeneration, when you are baptized, God, who washes away sin, he regenerates you, he rebirths you, he brings you back to what you, your previous state, which was innocence. Mm. Y'all yeah, yeah, yeah. walk with me now. He restores you to your first state. Now, I know you have heard that we are born sinners. 
Y'all, y'all ain't never heard of that? Yes. Now y'all stop tripping now. I not know I ain't the only one that heard that we pull off books. There are some who believe you are born a sinner. You are born in sin. Right. It's a it's a it's a spin-off from the doctrine called Calvinism, the tulip theory. All right, now which means man is totally depraved. When he when a child is born into this world, they believe that that child is a sinner. Well, according to the definition of regeneration, if I'm brought back to my previous state by God, well, if I'm born a sinner, then all God did was bring me back to being a sinner. Now, you know that doesn't fit. Regeneration literally means to be restored. But be restored to what? My first state, which was innocent. When I had no sin. Right. And, I, and, and when we get to a point in our life, we have to be honest, like Isaiah, we like sheep have all done what? Gone astray. And now you must come back to God. But watch the beauty in it. When you come back to God and he washes you and he regenerates you, he brings you back to your previous state, which was innocent, which carries the idea of you being justified. That is, God treats you as if you had never sinned. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sister Ball, they didn't get happy about that. Sister Ball, let me tell you. He regenerates us. He restores us. Now watch how this thing gets good. By the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a, it's a grammatical structure that says the wash, the regeneration, the washing of regeneration and the renewing takes place at the same time, which means the Holy Spirit renews us and God washes us and thus regenerates us all at the same time, which means he brings you back to your previous state, which means it doesn't matter how old you are, you are still as young as you if you were when you first came into the world. Amen. 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 Oh, you're in a state of innocence, man. Y'all ain't feeling me. Y'all say, well, Fred, that don't make sense. Because I mean, listen, even, even after I became a child of God, I still sin. I still fall. Well, John would say, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. And the blood of Jesus keeps on what? Amen. Wow. So it's not your work. It's the work of heaven that keeps you innocent. Are y'all singing this thing? <laughs> Man, it keeps you innocent. Ooh, he says, he says now, he says, God saved us. God poured out on us. Watch this in, in, in verse 8, 9, uh, verse 8, 6, I'm sorry, Lord. He says, whom he, he says now, this is the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Whom, whom he, the Holy Spirit, he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. In other words, God has a unlimited supply of mercy and an unlimited supply of the power of the Holy Spirit to change who you are. Are y'all seeing this? And he does it richly through Jesus Christ. Now, in case you didn't catch it, guess who's doing the work in your salvation and your transformation? God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three are at work in saving you and transforming you. That's right. Oh, watch it, watch it, watch it. Then he says, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heir. So now God saved us, God poured out on us his Holy Spirit, and then God has made us something. He has made you an heir, which means you now inherit everything Jesus had. Y'all don't believe that? That's Just right. check out Romans. Don't have time because y'all look like y'all don't want to turn no more scripture. So look at Romans chapter 8 and start in verse 14 and you'll find out that we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Yeah, right. God made you an heir, which means all that Jesus has as an heir, we seek to inherit what he has. Amen. Everything. Everything God has blessed Jesus with. Now, that doesn't mean, let me put this disclaimer here, that doesn't mean you're going to be omnipresent. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to be at, one, at all places at one time. 
That doesn't mean you're going to have all omni omniscience where you're going to know everything. And it certainly doesn't mean you're going to be om om omnipotent which you got all power. That's not what that means. What that means is you inherit all of the spiritual blessings that Jesus, we sit and rule and reign with our Lord and Savior. You inherit what he had. Now, the next thing he said, he says, and it comes as a result of us being justified. What does that mean? That simply means it's a legal term in which the, Paul says, we being justified, we have been declared righteous by God. We, we have been declared innocent of all charges. Are y'all hearing me? Amen. And uh, that's why I told you earlier, when you're justified, God treats you as if you had never committed a wrong. Because through Christ, his blood that washes you now justifies you. And because it justifies you, I can walk in faith in Christ even knowing that I'm imperfect. Because it's not the person that's, that's judging me who justifies me. It's the God who washed me that justifies me. Are y'all see y'all get this thing? Watch it. Now watch it. He said, now watch verse 8. Verse 8 is God's purpose. So we've got God made us. He made us heirs. Right? And he did it by, by showering upon us the power of the Holy Spirit. But then notice verse 8. The verse 8 really speaks to God's purpose for saving us. Watch this. This is a trustworthy statement. Concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to do what? Maintain. Get, maintain to engage in what? Y'all ain't said that like you mean it. Good works that you be made, that you will engage, maintain good works or good deeds. Now look at <coughs> chapter two, verse four, verse eleven. For the grace of God that appeared, for the grace of God has appeared to all men, bringing salvation uh, and instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteous, justly in this present world looking for that glorious appearance of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, right, that he might redeem us, and watch this, and that he might purify unto himself a people who zealous of what? Good works. Work. So when God saved you, he saved you to transform you. In transforming you, he transforms your life in such a way that you live for him uh, with a life of gratitude of the grace that's been given you. That's right. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. Now watch this. What stands between me being justified, me being washed, me being re me receiving the mercy of God, what stands between the sinner and the person receiving such mercy, receiving such grace, receiving this washing, receiving being in air, receiving this justification. It is baptism right. that stands between the sinner and him being washed, him being justified, him receiving mercy, him being made an heir. All of that, just that one condition, along with faith, stands between. Now, my question to you is, what do you need to break up with? Yeah. Right. right, right. What are you still, are you still holding on to what used to be? Yeah. God is saying, now man, I'm, I'm trying to break you free from this. I'm trying to get you, I'm trying to get this stuff as far away from you as possible. I have the power to do it. Why are you still holding on to it? What do you need to break away from? And even for you who are a Christian, that question is for you as well. Yeah. What do? What are you still holding? Are you still holding on to what used to be? Yeah. And you, I, I, I could have been this. I wish I was this. I wish I had done that. All of that stuff is what used to be. God is saying, man, I'm freeing you from all of that. 
What are you holding on to that's keeping you back from God? God says, I've been kind to you. I love you unconditionally. I shower you with all my blessings. I've given you life abundantly, right? Right. And, and, and let's just be real. If we wanted to get to the practical material aspect of it, God says you drive well, you eat good, you sleep comfortably, right? You even got a job to help pay for that stuff you got. I blessed you. It was by my hand that you had what you had. And some of you, God is saying, I blessed you to work long enough where you can even retire. Yeah. Right? I blessed you with that stuff. You are where you are right now. Some of you used to have excellent health. That's the hand of God, man. Right right Some of you with bad health, you still living. Yeah. Man, that's the grace and mercy of Almighty God. Yeah. You have what you have. You are where you are, all because of the mercy and the grace of God. Some of you are in school right now. You have gone farther than what your parents ever could have imagined. Right. You're getting degrees now. You're on your way to being somebody. Listen, that's all because of God's loving kindness for you. You have what you have. So what are you holding on to? Amen. Some of us still holding on to grudges. Oh, yeah. Amen. For over 15 years ago. Yeah. Every time I see him, I just remember what he did. <laughs> still holding on to that stuff. <laughs> right? Yeah. And listen, and the person you're holding the grudge, man, they're going, they don't even know you're still holding the grudge. <laughs> and they lay down and they go to sleep. Yeah. And y'all still mad. Yeah. Still frowned up. You holding on yeah. to what used to be. God has freed you, man, from that. That's right. Let you go. He break, he has broken you from the shackles. You are loosed. How did, how, Fred, how did that happen? When he washed you. When he washed you. When, when does that take place? In the occasion of baptism. Yeah. Having your, having your, 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 your body washed. Hebrews 12, I think it is. Having your body washed with pure water. Mm -hmm. Lutron. Mm -hmm. Apple Lutron. Mm -hmm. Getting yourself clean. That's, that's the breakup, y'all. Right. And, and then, let's just be real. Some of us need to break up not only with people, some of us need to break up from ourselves. Amen. I think it was Jesus who said, if any man wishes to come after me, let him first deny what? Himself. Yeah, yeah, take up the cross. Sometimes it ain't the other, it ain't outside and external influences that cause the problem. Sometimes it's me. God says you need to break up with yourself. Isn't that right? Yeah, sometimes you need to have that conversation like Mr. Brown said. I said to myself, self, and myself said, me. <laughs> yeah, you need, <laughs> you, need to, you need to have that conversation with self. Self, am I getting too high-minded? Yeah. Self, am I getting too arrogant? Yeah. Self, am, am I making this all about me? Right? right? Self, am, am I being selfish and not selfless? Right. Sometimes you gotta have a conversation with self, and sometimes you gotta break up with self. Amen. Yeah, yeah. So that you can have a more fruitful life with God. Amen. Some of y'all looking at me like, who is Mr. Brown? <laughs> <laughs> Ask your neighbor when y'all get out of here and tell me. <laughs> if there's someone who needs to give their life to the Lord, I just told you how you need to be washed. You come to Jesus by faith. And then you turn. Now, repentance is a turn, a change of mind, but it's more than that. It's it's a coming to the result that I'm going to change my life. Yeah. That's what that is. That I'm turning this thing around and I'm turning towards God. I'm going to adopt a different way of living. And, and what you're really saying when you repent is saying, God, I'm coming to you because it's time for me to break up yeah. with some stuff. And then you, you come to Jesus. You confess that he is Lord, and then you put Jesus on in baptism. You be immersed. Now watch this now, because it's not a work of man. People will say baptism is a work of man. If you go back and read the text carefully, he says he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That has all to do with God. Amen. Yeah. Right? So the baptizer isn't washing your sins away. 
It's God who washes it. It's an executive act that takes place in the mind of God. Yeah. You hear what I'm saying? And so you, you come on. Matter of fact, when you watch it, man, he breaks it away. And then if you just go back to what we talked about last Sunday, uh, it's God who does the operating in Colossians 2. He says when we're buried with him in baptism, he says we come to him by faith in the operation of God. He cuts that stuff away. Yeah. Look at that. That's by God. Now, when we come back next Sunday, we'll talk about make the call because a lot of people have a different understanding of what he means by calling on the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you grammatically calling on the name of the Lord ain't a verb of call. Right. Mm -hmm. Calling on the, name of, on the name of the Lord is something you do. Yeah. 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 I'll show yeah. it to you next Sunday. I'll come back next Sunday, though. Yeah. Yeah. Come back next Sunday. So if there's a child of God who you, you have not been living uh, an elevated life, then it's time for you to also break up with some stuff. It's time for you to come clean and say, God, no more. And don't you ever just get to a point where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired? Yeah. yeah. Where you just go, you're just tired of just doing it. You, Lord, I've been, I've been doing it how I've been wanting to do it on my own terms. Like, like I've been trying to figure this thing out by, by myself. And it, it wearies you. Right. You know what I'm saying? It really, it breaks you down. And Jesus is saying, I, I tried to tell you that you need to take my yoke. Learn of me, right? My burden is easy. You know, right? I, I, don't, I won't burden you with following me. I won't wear you down with following me. Right. And as a matter of fact, I'll give you strength to carry right. what's burdensome to you. Right. Isn't that right? Yeah. So if you need to respond, I pray you do. You need prayer. You come on. You want to give your life to the Lord. You want to be baptized for the remission of your sin. You come on right now and we'll do it today. As together we stand and we sing the invitation song.